and I think we may start. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, we are going to start uh, the conversation with Dr. Michael Spence. We already have enough uh, people. Uh, we are live in YouTube already. Okay. okay. Um, dear Professor Spence, dear Mark, dear colleagues, I am honored to open the important discussion with one of the most esteemed and eminent economists, Nobel Prize winner and Professor of Economics, Dr. Michael Spence. Dear Professor Spence, uh, my name is Maksat Kurbenov. I am Managing Director of the Inclusive Development Foundation. And uh, I remember when uh, I first met you in person, it was exactly 10 years ago at the uh, 2011 BOA Forum in China. It was a beautiful day with a sunny weather and uh, crowds of people. Uh, and you were speaking on China development. And it was outside of the conference room on the open air uh, at the shore of the river. I hope these days will come back soon and uh, we will be able to watch your speech in person. It's my great honor to welcome you today with us. Uh, thank you for your time and passion to discuss the critical issues of global economy, emerging markets and Kazakhstan in uh, post COVID uh, era. Uh, in a region we were planning to have uh, this discussion in April at the Nobel Fest. I know that you are busy on these dates and I want to thank you for being able to switch the time of the conversation for today. Uh, let me kindly introduce our today's event, which is part of the Central Asia Nobel Fest. The Nobel Fest is non-commercial and non-government meeting where we unite in global scientists and academia with uh, local students and experts. On April 7th till 9th, we are going to host the second Nobel Festival entitled uh, Inventing the Future under the three major tracks, economy of opportunities, industry of the future, and educational trends. We plan to have more than 30 debates with around 50 speakers, including eight Nobel Prize and nine Breakthrough Prize winners and distinguished uh, experts in economics like Jeffrey Sachs and Xavier Salamartin. The major event which is going to be part of the Nobel Fest will be the series of uh, Nobel lectures from April 12th to 16th, where we will have 15 world scientists and Nobel Prize winners uh, to deliver lectures for students of Kazakhstan and Central Asia. Of course, the participation is free of charge. We welcome all participants to join these meetings dedicated uh, to the development of human capital of the region. Dear ladies and gentlemen, our conversation today will run for one hour. The format of the meeting is following. We start with a 30 minutes conversation with Dr. Spence moderated by Mark Kuzan. And the second part will be devoted for Q&A with local experts and economists. And uh, dear experts, before we start the Q&A, your microphones will be switched off. Please make sure your mics are switched on if you wish to ask questions. For asking questions, you may raise your hand or write in the chat room. Chat room. Uh, and people joining us through YouTube may put questions into the chat box. Let me remind you that we are live in YouTube and the broadcast will be is available already in uh, English and Russian languages. Uh, let me start with a welcoming remarks from uh, the South Kazakhstan University who has kindly agreed to become a partner of this discussion. And I know that a lot of students from these universities are watching us online. Uh, dear, uh, dear Aigul, uh, she is a deputy rector of uh, Awezov University. Uh, please, floor is yours. And uh, uh, Aigul will be speaking in, uh, in Russian. So 
Mark uh, and uh, Dr. Spence, you may uh, switch the language. Dear Aigul, please. Спасибо большое, Максат, за предоставленное слово Южно-Казахстанскому университету. Я начну свое приветствие. Уважаемые ученые, преподаватели, студенты, Южно-Казахстанский университет имени Ауэзова рад сегодня приветствовать вас в преддверии второго фестиваля Нобелевских лауреатов, который в этом году проходит под девизом «Изобретая будущее». Наш университет является, является одним из крупных многопрофильных вузов страны, уже второй год принимает активное участие на данном научном мероприятии в качестве стратегического партнера. Одновременно южно казахстанский университет планирует провести в рамках фестиваля серию своих научных мероприятий, в том числе ежегодную научно-практическую конференцию «Промышленные технологии инжиниринг-2021». Уважаемые участники онлайн-встречи, Инновационность фестиваля 2021 года в том, что впервые Нобелевские лауреаты и известные мировые ученые будут выступать специально для университетов Казахстана и стран Центральной Азии. Поэтому нам сегодня двойне приятно, что на базе нашего университета состоится первая лекция выдающегося мирового эксперта и лауреата первой Нобелевской премии, премии по экономике за, за 2000, ну, в 21 веке Майкла Спенса. Уважаемый профессор Майкл Спенс, Позвольте от имени всего коллектива нашего университета поблагодарить вас за первую лекцию для наших студентов и преподавателей. Это важное событие для нас, потому что сейчас университет осуществляет трансформацию в исследовательский и предпринимательский вуз. Сегодня мы видим, что пандемия коронавируса изменила мир на наших глазах. Многие страны испытывают экономический кризис. В то же время перемены коснулись и рынка труда, и человеческого капитала в целом. Мы стали свидетелями смены эпохи хай-тек, эпохи хай-хью, направленной на раскрытие индивидуальных талантов и коллективных возможностей людей. Именно за таланты сегодня будет вестись конкурентная борьба, на что и вы заостряете внимание в своих лекциях и выступлениях. Профессор Майкл Спенс, пользуясь случаем, разрешите пригласить вас посетить наш, наш университет, который находится в самом э, юге Казахстана, в одном из старейших и крупнейших городов, городе Шамкент. Мы будем очень рады и вдохновлены, если сможем установить с вами долгосрочные отношения, направленные на развитие казахстанской науки и реализацию перспективных научных проектов. Как говорится, большая наука не имеет границ, и тяга человека к знаниям, любознательность вечны. Еще раз выражаем вам свою благодарность и признание. Спасибо большое. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Aigul, for this uh, important uh, speech. Uh, dear Mark, please, uh, you may start uh, part number one, the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Maxat. Uh, let me thank you first for having the opportunity to give me the the possibility to uh, uh, moderate this uh, very uh, interesting and very important conversation about, I think, setting the stage and to kick off your very interesting initiative uh, with the Nobel Feast. I congratulate you for, for making that happening. And of course, starting with this conversation about the prospect of the global economy is, is uh, very, very good and very interesting. I'm very glad to introduce our our guest today, uh, Professor Michael Spence, the way we are going to run this conversation as you described at the beginning will be to have a type of conversation with uh, Professor Spence about the state of the global economy, the risk, but also the opportunities, the building back better, the reset of the global economy. And we will follow that by some questions and answers from the audience who are coming from different universities from uh, Central Asia and also from local experts. Uh, Mark, thank you very much uh, for joining us this morning to you. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. Let me introduce you to our audience. So Mark Spence is a professor of economics at uh, New York University and the Leonard Stern School of Business since September 2010. He's a senior fellow at the Uber Institution and the Philip Knight Professor Emeritus of Management in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. Mark is also a Rhodes Scholar 
and re received and was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize of Economics in 2001 and the John Bates Clark Medal from the American Economic Association in 1981. He's also the author of three books and 50 articles and is a member of the American Economic Associations and a fellow of the American Academy of Art and Sciences and the Economic Society. Mike, thank you very much for being with us. It's a great pleasure. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. Uh, and, and thank um, you, Max. And thanks also to our organizers. So, Max, the way I would like to conduct this conversation is clearly to ask you first, you know, is a, you thinking about the prospect of the global economy. We have been seeing some signs that the global recovery is underway. Of course, this uh, sign of recovery has been driven mainly by the deployment of vaccine. And of course, the huge stimulus program in the United States, that is, I think, a big and a game changer, which I think if we look back at the three stimulus program, it's almost 24% of GDP in the US. But of course, uh, in order to have a strong global recovery, we need a recovery that is going to be happening everywhere in the world. This is not the case today. And recently, you were chairing uh, with the uh, Professor Joe Stiglitz um, an important uh, commission about global economic transformation. And this year, uh, the report that I think has been released recently about the global response to the pandemic highlighted you know, the challenges and the long-term assessment for making you know, the global economy more inclusive and more sustainable. Uh, we know that the global economy today, if I look at the OECD recent forecast, will grow by 5.6% in 2021, and they forecast 4% in 2022. So, Mike, maybe one of my first questions is clearly about the state of the global economy, and how can we make sure that it's going to be an adequate economic recovery? Over to you. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure, a really pleasure and an honor to be with you. Um, so let me, let me try this. Uh, so we, we're living, th you know, through a pandemic economy. It's, uh, it's been difficult for everybody and, and, and very challenging. Um, so let me start with Asia. So Asia, you know, a number of countries in Asia are unique in having um, essentially contained the virus without the benefit of vaccines. And so the economic recovery there is well underway. Uh, China is the only major economy in the world that posted positive real growth in 2020. Um, now the rest of us are going to join because the vaccine rollout is coming. And so I'm actually expecting uh, pretty eye popping growth numbers, uh, but you've got to be a bit careful with growth. Normally when you see high growth numbers, things are, 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 are in pretty good shape. Um, but actually, in this case, you know, because of the magnitude of the contraction many of us experienced in a wide range of countries, um, a lot of this high growth is just going to be essentially getting back to where we started at the, at the end of 2019. Um, so I, let me kind of finish with the, you know, a tour of the global economy. So Asians well underway. Uh, the vaccine rollout is proceeding fairly rapidly. Um, depending on where you are, uh, but it'll come in waves. Um, so the, you know, I expect the, the second half of this year in the United States uh, to, to post some pretty high growth numbers and the recovery will probably be fairly complete as we enter 2022, um, subject to global headwinds. Europe is well behind, um, be, partly because it, it, it suffered a bigger contraction and the vaccine rollout is slower and that economic dynamics are slightly weaker as well. Um, the UK is an, an exception to that. Um, then you get to you know, a, a, a very diverse picture when you get to um, emerging economies and developing economies. So, I mean, the, the main thing to say is that the vaccine rollout really hasn't started very, very much in a, a wide range of countries. And so that report that you referred to that, um, that Joe and I and others wrote was an attempt to sort of make sure that the vaccine rollout proceeds as rapidly as possible um, across the global economy, the entire global economy. And that means ramping up um, production capacity of a variety of vaccines coming from Russia, China, Europe, North America, and so on, 
and 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 we think you know some pretty aggressive uh, licensing of the uh, technologies for these vaccines is needed in order to <clears throat> essentially leverage the global's production capacity, um, and then it has to be distributed. So right now it's a little uncoordinated, and I think there's a serious risk that the vaccine rollout won't proceed as rapidly as possible. Um, you adverted earlier to the to a proposition that I think everybody accepts, which is uh, was I think put best by my friend Mohammed Alarian. He said, "We're not safe until everyone's safe, basically." And we and 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 the economic version of that is we can't fully recover in the global economy until everybody is back on their feet and recovering. So I, I think that that's a kind of simple statement of where we're where we are. My hope is that by the time we get through 2022, we'll have the vast majority of the countries in the global economy back on their feet. But if we you know, do a bad job of this rollout after it gets through the, the developed countries uh, and a number of countries that you know, have big capacity for production and so on, um, then I, then I, then I think it could get be have a, a long and very um, difficult tail. L let me just say one other thing, and then I'll turn it back to you. The pandemic economy has been a, a significant negative shock, not just in term in macroeconomic terms, but distributionally. If you look inside countries as well as across the global economy, what you see is that the People, people with lower incomes, the people who are more vulnerable, have take have have, have absorbed a disproportionate um, fraction of the of the burden. I could elaborate on that, but but I think it's pretty intuitively obvious. Um, in within countries, that you know, we shut down whole sectors in order to try to contain the virus. And when you look at what those sectors are, hospitality, travel, tourism, you know sporting events, entertainment, and so on, a very large number of people, you know, who work in those sectors lost their jobs um, or were furloughed or something like that. And they tend not to be the higher income people. The higher income people <clears throat> were on Zoom, you know, resume, keeping, sustaining their activity in finance and so on. So, and then when you look across the world, the, the kind of fiscal stimulus that we've um, had in the United States um, is not really, you know, possible um, in a wide range of countries. Just don't have the fiscal resources. So you had you had a a pandemic hit um, that um, that hit countries with, you know, less capacity on the medical front, um, less access to the vaccines now, and less fiscal capacity to buffer the shock for their citizens. So I think part of the rebuilding in the global economy has to be focused on reversing these distributional effects. Very good. And Mike, when you talk about uh, distributions and the long-term effect of the pandemic, uh, I remember the IMF in a recent report with the World Economic Outlook talk a lot about long-term scaring. The fact that you said we are going to see a lot of jobs that will not appear again, particularly in the services sector. So how we are going to redeploy human capital, you know, not only within the advanced countries, but also within the developing world. I mean, uh, where I live here in Paris, you know, I can clearly see now, not only the restaurants, coffee, clothes, but maybe they will not, uh, you know, reopen again, because uh, for the moment they got support, you know, from the, the fiscal authorities. But at one point we might see a wave of bankruptcies, uh, maybe unemployment will rise. So, the long-term scaring, is it something that uh, can be, you know, like a, a drag, you know, for, for global economy? Well, in the short and medium term, the, the answer is definitely yes. We are going to lose some businesses that didn't have, even with public sector support, didn't have the resources to make it through, um, especially in those sectors that were essentially shut down. So the answer is yes. I, I don't think that effect is permanent. Um, the permanent effects may come if there's a, a fundamental shift in demand. Um, so, but but nevertheless, it's a, a significant headwind and it's worse. I mean, you don't rebuild businesses sort of overnight uh, for sure. So one of the things that happened in the, 
in the pandemic economy is that there was just an enormous acceleration in the in the digital sectors um, for the obvious reason that it was required to survive. Um, and so, you know, w we all knew that we had major, you know, sort of transitions in work, in, you know, in skills and other things that were going along with the digital transformation of the global economy. I mean, it's not proceeding at the same pace everywhere. It's not even proceeding at the same pace sector by sector, but with almost no exceptions, there's been a huge acceleration in every, you know, in education and health, you know, in finance, you know, we, in just to give an example, um, we were lagging in mobile contact of payments in the United States. That gap is significantly closed just because the pandemic economy pushed us in that direction. So I think, you know, this focus that we've had for some time on, on sort of human centered growth, on making sure people have the resources and the institutional access uh, to build a, a future for themselves that's consistent with the way the global economy is, and especially the digital transformation. Those things are just crucial. Mike, you talk about um, also about fiscal space and um, mm -hmm. questions for you. One, do you think that the stimulus plans in the US and the recent Biden plan that has been quite dramatic, do you think this is a change of paradigm in macroeconomic policy? And number two, <laughs> What's about emerging market? I mean, emerging market, of course, the policy tools are more limited in emerging world. Uh, we saw in March a big episode of capital outflow, you know, during the, the pandemic, but also at the same time, you know, emerging market were able to lower interest rate and capital flow were resuming. So how do you mm -hmm. assess first, you know, the US, I think, and the current uh, administration, do we see a shift in paradigm in terms of macroeconomic policy? We have to go big because we learned the lesson of the 2000 financial crisis. And at the same time, we saw that in emerging economies, of course, the situation is rather different. So what can be done to give more fiscal space also to emerging markets? Well, I think that, you know, the direct answer to that is um, we have the international financial institutions. They're important, they have resources. I think we should expand those resources, which means, you know, the, the uh, the um, higher income emerging economies, upper middle income and the developed economies should commit to adding to the resource base of the IMF, the World Bank and some of the regional development banks. Um, and, and secondly, there's this conversation which sort of sounds nerdy, I think to most people <clears throat> about um, an expanded um, set of SDRs whose allocation is sort of automatic to various countries, but the, but the proposition that many people subscribe to, including me, is that the, the, the countries that don't need the additional allocate, we're talking about 650 mm -hmm. uh, billion, I think. Um, the countries that don't need the extra allocation, like Europe and the United States, should, should move that allocation to the developing countries, and that will create fiscal space for them, um, because SDRs are how you settle up. Um, between countries, you know, in terms of the balance of payments and, and currencies. So I think there's a real opportunity there. On the, on the more general question, Mark, I mean, you know, you, I mean, as I'm sure you and many others on the, on the call today are aware, there's, a, there's you know, a, a sort of a battle <laughs> going on over, you know, sort of how much fiscal space there really is. Um, and, and over the stimulus package with the kind of heavyweights of the, the world of macroeconomics weighing in on, on either side. Um, and, you know, I don't know how to arbitrate that. Um, you know, I guess we'll find out as we go along. But I think what, 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 what I think it has happened, both in the United States and Europe, is an awareness that, first of all, that there probably is more fiscal space than we previously thought, at least for these countries. And that in times you know, of a big shock or a major transformation, it's probably a good idea to use that fiscal space. Now th that proposition can be um, deployed irresponsibly, I think, <laughs> um, because the proposition that as long as the central bank keeps buying the debt, there's no limit, I think is nonsense. And, um, and I, I don't think that's, I mean, there are people who think that, but it's not the majority view. So. 
so bottom line is, I, uh, you know, I think the Biden administration is making this big effort largely driven and not just by the recovery, but the need to sort of reverse these dramatically bad trends in terms of equal inequality um, in our economy, which the pandemic made worse. And so, and, and I don't think he's running excessive risks, he and his administration in the, in the short to medium run. Um, but, you know, we're gonna have a lot more debt, even in, uh, in a country like the United States, and 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 uh, there's lots of countries in the world that you know probably couldn't mount a fiscal effort of this kind. I think you're right. I think the the retrospective view of the response to the great financial crisis, both in North America and in Europe, was that it, the response was too weak. Uh, I think experts agree that we probably had to bail out the financial system, a wildly unpopular. Um, set of activities for sure. Uh, but then we kind of didn't keep going and try to sort of undo the damage that in what Americans call Main Street, um, or at least not enough. You know, um, Mike, you mentioned uh, clearly uh, that we might be going to a war that is going to be more more depth, of course, all over the world, not only in the US, but also in, in Europe here, a world that is going to yep. be maybe more local. That's another, and of course, more digital. And if we take the example of the country with our host today, Kazakhstan, you know, like a country that's been driven, you know, economic growth thanks to resources, oil, and so on. Uh, this country has been hit by different shocks over the last 10, 15 years. You know, one has been, you know, the commodity cycle, trade, and now they are facing another shock with the pandemic. So when we look at uh, you know, policy advice from the IMF and a lot of international institutions, when they look at emerging markets, they said, ah, oh, we need to build back better, we need the reset, and this country is now needs to drive and shift their economy to become more green and more digital. So of course, it's some, something that you can do overnight. So what is your advice for emerging market you know, in thinking about growth model? You remember we have this uh, scenario in the 1990s that emerging market would converge. You know, there was a convergence, you know, like emerging market. But now we might be going back to divergence. You know? So what is your assessment mm -hmm. from the emerging market world in terms of driver of growth? And maybe whatever you can say on Kazakhstan per se, because I think uh, uh, these countries, but a lot of EM you know, are thinking about how they're going to manage, you know, the next decade, you know, after this uh, big uh, scaring with, uh, with the pandemic? Yeah, th man, these are very important and, and somewhat complicated questions. So um, but let me try to stay in, on focus. Um, the, I think the answer to the question, you know, what, what, what's the way forward yeah. really yeah. depends on kind of which country you're talking about what its income level is and so on. Mm -hmm. So my sense is we are gonna live in a digital world and we ought to start thinking about it and investing in it, especially in the human capital side. I mean, one of the really encouraging things uh, of when you cast your eye around the global economy is notwithstanding all the, all the setbacks and headwinds we have, there's literally an explosion of entrepreneurship around the world. And much of it is, is in and around digital and digital platforms where the entry barriers are low, where good ideas can be tried out and thrive, where these ecosystems are increasingly well coordinated and put together. And you see this, I mean, it's not just, I mean, we used to think most of this technology occurred in one or two places in the world. It's not true anymore. It's occurring everywhere. China, United States, Indonesia, you know, India for sure. Um, there's lots of interesting startups in, uh, in Latin America and in Africa and so on. I mean, it's really quite striking. Um, so I think, you know, getting ready to be part of that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the institutional arrangements is, is an important part of the story. My sense is that for, you know, middle income countries, especially in the upper range, um, the opportunities are, 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 are great. And the opportunities out, in some ways outweigh the challenges that is, um, in the developed countries, I think we some, have some major work-related challenges to, to go through. Uh, I'm not saying that the emerging economies don't have that problem, uh, but you know, but the expansion of the set of opportunities for new businesses, for employment, and so on, is really is really impressive.
Um, now, you know, if we had more time, I could sort of give you data from studies that have been done this, but I'm, I'm quite confident that this is true. The um, early stage developing countries, the lower income ones is a different story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but basically we're moving into, you know, increasingly service economies, even in the developing world. Um, and the classic development development model for, and forgive me, this is not the Kazakhstan case because Kazakhstan's incomes is, are higher yep. and resource rich uh, for sure. But, but I wanna mention this. So the classic development model for non-resource rich countries was to leverage um, high quality, low cost labor in labor intensive process oriented manufacturing and assembly. Um, the digital technologies are very close, if not at the point of taking out that, uh, that whole set of things, right? We have ro these are all breakthroughs in the last 10 years. Robots can see, they have fine motor coordination, they can assemble electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that wasn't true even 10 years ago. So, so I think one of the things that you know, global leaders need to think about is, and, and leaders in these countries is so, you know, what's the development model if it isn't leveraging your comparative advantage in that area anymore? I mean, this has dramatic implications for the way global supply chains are put together and so on that, you know, take a long time to kind of work your way through. Um, but I think there's a real challenge. And, and the simple truth is you need the global economy to, to achieve high sustained growth. So you have to connect with it somehow. And, and that connection has to probably has to be through services. Which, which then has implications for the human capital um, development. Now for Kazakhstan, I mean, you know, we, 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 countries already lived in a highly volatile market with respect to commodity prices, to put it mildly. I mean, I think underneath that, we are at an inflection point with respect to taking sustainable um, growth paths, especially with respect to climate change seriously. So I, you know, I think, um, the planning ought to be on, uh, on and around a steady transition um, to uh, a, a different uh, kind of way of putting economies together on the energy side. It's not going to happen overnight, mm -hmm. but I think the, the plan should be to invest heavily in human capital and resources that allow the economy to diversify um, uh, and particularly in these in these in these digital areas, as 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 these uh, as this whole thing works out over the next decade. I mean, the what's the time horizon? I mean, the net zero commitments that are now being made run in the 2050 to 2060 range. <clears throat> They're not sufficient yet to solve the global the climate change problem for sure. And the next meeting, uh, CAP 26 or whatever, will, will be an attempt to up those commitments so that we get closer to where we need to be. Um, but that's the world we're going to live in. And, and, and it creates enormous opportunities. I mean, I think, you know, if we, a country with the resources um, and a, and a, uh, a, a well-conceived investment program, including in the green side, of the uh, of of uh, the growth model, you know, we'll we'll have basically Mark, the way I think about it, you know, from an investment point of view, is there we've we've gone through this inflection point. Pretty much everybody's committed. Even the United States is back in the game. There's huge demand for solutions, right? Yes. And the question is, can the supply side, can technology and entrepreneurs and innovative solutions, you know? over time come up to meet this demand. And that I think is where the opportunity lies. When you, you mentioned, you know, zero net economy, I think you have been visiting China quite often. Um, when you look at the global economy and you see the trends between the two economic powers, China and US, you feel a trend toward maybe more decoupling, you know, that, uh, so can we continue to, to define that we are one global economy if you see two countries who are trying to rebuild their own autonomy. I mean, China is investing a lot in the, in green, in the green economy. US is trying to be less dependent on China. So how you assess you know, uh, this new US-China relations in terms of uh, economics that can have ramification for the rest of the world you know, and also for, for global governance? Well, there is a kind of decoupling process underway. Yeah. Um, 
On the other hand, we were pretty interdependent before. Well, we all are, yeah. <laughs> uh, the way the global economy is. So it takes a fair amount of work to really decouple. And I, I don't think it's you know imminent. Um, but the tensions are there. Um, and they and the, and the tensions are you know spilling over not from trade to investment to technology to kind of intellectual um, property and 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 to the regulation of the internet. I mean, I think one of the things we're all going to have to face up to is that you know 15 years ago most of us had the vision of the internet as this sort of globally open standard protocols network you know, that was just all good, right? We could all talk to each other and that was terrific. Well, that's a bit, with a benefit of hindsight, that was a bit naive, right? Um, there's all kinds of things that the internet brings and, you know, capacity to organize bad stuff, you know, uh, misleading information. It's, it's, it just has had impacts that go way beyond what was originally envisaged. Um, in political life and the way societies put together and interacts and so on. So we're all gonna have to wrestle with each other, but those, but those, but, but th that set of issues is gonna tend to pull us apart um, mm -hmm. because we're gonna go into that process with somewhat different values, somewhat different approaches to dealing with the problem. You know, for example, I wouldn't be surprised if we're heading into a world in which virtually all all countries and regions insist that you know key batches of data be maintained locally on their soil and there will be restrictions on the flow of data look man, man the global supply chains are built on digital platforms increasingly and you know digital platforms don't work very well if data doesn't flow across them so you know none of us knows really at least i don't uh you know where this is all going to lead but i think we have to accept um, for now, that we're that practically speaking, we're going to live in a world in which there's more fragmentation, you know, and pulling things apart a little bit, driven by these considerations. Some of them are national security and so on. I think the challenge, if you accept that, then the challenge is not to let it go too far, you know, not to go back to the world in which you know there were two sort of you know groups. The, the people call this the Cold War, but you know, it's it's definitely not a good idea to go there. And so, I, my hope is that, notwithstanding the tensions, that we uh, that leaders from all parts of the world sit down together, and um, and say, well, there's areas where we where we we need to cooperate. We we for sure want to maintain the open flow of knowledge and technology, which has benefited the world. I mean, there's. Did. And I think that's pretty, we can count on that. It's pretty hard to stop that, right? Yeah, yeah. If somebody has a good idea in Kazakhstan, you know, pretty soon it'll show up in uh, Moscow, Beijing, you know, Paris and New York. Um, and you, you have to work pretty hard to prevent that from happening. Um, but there's lots of areas where we need to cooperate. Climate change is an example, health. I don't see any reason strategically for not cooperating in health and, and other things. So I think what we're headed for after a, a period of sort of tense interaction um, in the short run is, is a kind of more mature uh, kind of rebuilding that focuses on areas where there's huge benefits to everybody um, for, for cooperating. And we'll just have to agree to differ on some of their areas. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, now I think, Max said, we can shift to the uh, Q&A, if you agree. And let me try, because I think they send me... Uh, uh, yes, yes, Mark, please. Uh, let's start uh, uh, the second part. Yeah, is there anyone who is uh, apparently part of the conversation here who wants to ask questions? Who I start with the one I have received on the, on the chat box. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, we have a lot of people here and, uh, if someone wish to ask questions, you may just raise your hand and, uh, Mark, you, for the moment, you may start with the questions in chat box. Okay. Already. Okay. <laughs> there's a Mark, there's a whole lot of questions that have to do with 
you know, the informational structure of markets and, and I think digital technology. So maybe yeah, we ought yeah, to... Exactly. Oh, yeah, exactly. I was just now, now looking at the... Uh, didn't have time to, to put all of them together, but let's start with the one that I see. How do you think, according to your earlier research, market signaling, information transfer in airing and reality screening process as a changing characteristic of job applicant transformed for potential employers during the pandemic and post-pandemic? That's one of the questions. Well, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, there, there's a whole, there's a bunch of questions that are around, surround this yeah. area. So, so, so let me, um, I'll, I'll try to do this briefly. But um, I believe the digital technologies are are closing informational gaps of the yeah. type that we, you know, those of us who received the Nobel Prize in 2001 were focused on, whether it was signaling or screening or whatever. Um, and 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 that's really important. Uh, you know, the hallmark of the digital technologies is that you know, first of all, da data is a non-rivalrous good. It can be used over and over again, just like knowledge or other kinds of information. Um, and now we have this breakthrough in artificial intelligence. So I think what 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 you can see, um, if you look at examples of the use of these technologies, is that you can actually dramatically close informational gaps in a way that promotes inclusive growth patterns. So let, let me, let me, so that's pretty general. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Um, that we studies in, in, in a Chinese academy in Hangzhou called the Luan Academy that a number of us are advisors to have shown one, that the digital technologies, the growth patterns associated with them are dramatically inclusive. Uh, you know, because for the reasons I mentioned before, you know, the ecosystems are pretty complete. It's a new way of coordinating economic activity. The entry barriers are low. Complementary needs for a startup are, are, are all present there. But the mo to me, the most interesting thing occurs in the area of finance. So it's well known that in many countries, um, small businesses have difficulty accessing credit, I mean, capital. Um, at reasonable cost. And what's happening in China, and I believe will happen in a wide range of, of countries, is that using data and the data that comes from the e-commerce and mobile payment systems, which is a huge amount of data, by the way, you can actually make credit assessments for people who are otherwise nearly anonymous to the traditional systems. They don't have collateral, they don't really have a track record that's that it's accessible on a cost, you know, effective basis. Banks have trouble dealing with them, but these platforms don't, right? Now the platforms have to be regulated, and there's financial issues and a whole lot of other things if you're interested in these things. But but the bottom line is, you know, people who were had trouble accessing a key element of the economy because of informational asymmetries and gaps. These gaps are being closed. Uh, and there's many examples of that. So I think this is a huge opportunity, actually. Uh, and, and the opportunity gets bigger and bigger the more you're dealing with people who's be either because of remoteness or, or limited interaction with the system before um, is, uh, is, is dramatically enhanced, i.e. It, it's, an um, it's an inclusive growth pattern. Yeah, I think the financial inclusion, which I think is very relevant for a country like in Central Asia, who don't have access to the banking sector, the traditional banking sector. And I think even right. during the pandemic, you know, we saw in a lot of countries, you know, the use of fintech to provide stimulus from government, you know, to, to the household. So that's, I totally agree. That's right. That you use a, a huge undertaking, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, and by the way, we related to that, you know, I'm, I'm curious to have your view as you see more and more, not only uh, innovation in terms of um, the payment system, you know, all over the world. You know, I mean, you, you mentioned here uh, the example of China, of course, with uh, uh, Ante Financial, with Alipay, but also, you know, more and more countries around the world, particularly in central banking, are more and more thinking now about uh, central bank digital currency, which also uh, are going to be another maybe outcome of this crisis, you know, like clearly a world that is going to become more digital. How do you, I don't know if you have been thinking about it, you know, like, uh, are we going to be in a world where more and more central bank, you know, will shift toward more digital money? And at the end, the interconnections within these digital currencies, you know, the ECB, 
has mentioned in the paper that they would like really to think and to issue a digital euro within five years. China, I think, has been talking for the last two years, so like a type of digital one might, might be coming soon. So what is your assessment? You know, are we moving toward a world where less cash, more digital, but also maybe more close as you might seek maybe a type of new type of capital control when you start to think about you know, the way this uh, digital money will interact among each other. Of course, it's a little far away from our global economy, short-term outlook, but uh, long-term uh, long view on this. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we're, we're so, maybe the easiest way to say it is the route we're gonna get there. So we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna have digital payment systems and then build, and then because you can move money around easily, yeah. um, we're gonna have, you know, uh, platform-based financial services of a whole variety of kinds, asset management, et cetera. And then we'll struggle with the regulatory things. And then the central banks won't want private companies, you know, the ones who, who you know, own the platforms uh, to be in total control of this system. Um, and so they'll introduce digital currencies, you know, that are basically central bank. Uh, based and I, I don't see any, any anything wrong with that. And yes, I think we're going to we're moving away from cash. Uh, and by the way, with a lag in countries that you know have legacy systems like credit cards and debit cards and checks and stuff like that, we're going to move away from that too. Yeah. <laughs> it just take us a little longer because legacy systems have their own interest groups. Um, and so, I mean, it's just demonstrably clear. That you know, in 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 certain dimensions, the uh, emerging economies are are going to and China's in the lead in this are going to do these things first because they they don't have these legacy systems in the way. I think one of the things that people get confused about, and I'll I'll just conclude on this, is we started with these you know so-called crypto yeah. uh, currencies, which really aren't currencies at all. Uh, they're just sort of assets of some kind. Um, and blockchain has important uses, um, I believe. And there are experts in blockchain, many more expert than I am. And I think blockchain has its uses because of the ability to track a set of transactions over time in a way that's not easily altered. You know, so it has applications in supply chains, it has applications in cross-border movements of, of money and so on. But I don't think these digital currencies are really heavily dependent on the blockchain technology, right? I mean, we don't want, you know, a, uh, we don't want to build, you know, financial systems or currencies on electronic systems that, you know, use up half the electricity generation of the of the plant and to implement. So, I mean, I, I think the, so the bottom line is, you know, we're going to have blockchain for, for certain uses, but we're going to have digital currencies that central banks really control, um, and 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 that seems to and and there and we're going to get great benefits from that. I mean, is just take payments. I mean, I've been told that the mobile payment systems, like the ones that you know are highly penetrated in China. First of all, it's important for people to understand these mobile payment systems started in the online world, but they now are, operate in the entire economy, right? Yeah. When you go down and buy, you know, a candy bar at the convenience store now, people are paying for that with, you know, their phone, right? So it's the whole consumer economy, um, which means there's just trillions of transactions going through it, right? And so, so that trend, I think it's going to occur everywhere. Very good. So we have... Um, uh, yeah, Mark, we have a question from uh, Adlet Tastanbekov, who, who has raised uh, his hand. Okay. And, uh, let, okay. I, let I, us you, we give you the floor. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Adlai. Uh, I major uh, in management at Awazic University. Uh, my personal question will be, uh, what is your personal perspective for the economic uh, recovery and privacy reduction after the COVID-19 pandemic in Kazakhstan? Um, because of an echo, I, that was hard for me to understand. Could, did somebody, could you say, say it again or? 
Repeat, yeah, Max. Um, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes. Uh, can you repeat your question, please? I'm so sorry for the internet. Uh, and my, my question was, what is your personal perspective for the economic recovery and poverty reduction after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Kazakhstan? Uh, yes, uh, economic recovery and uh, the uh, poverty reduction policies required in, uh, in the post-COVID uh, time in uh, Kazakhstan in, uh, and in emerging markets. I really, I mean, I mean, look, I think probably everybody on the call knows more about the specifics of the Kazakhstan situation than I, I do. So, um, you know, I mean, I have a kind of general knowledge, but uh, so, so let me take the, the part. I mean, I, you know, I think the single most important thing uh, and this is not something countries can do by themselves, is to get the vaccine rolled out around the world as fast as possible. It's just absolutely critical. Otherwise, we're going to have a bifurcation, um, you know, between countries that, you know, get the virus under control and, and countries that don't. I mean, I think most people accept the proposition um, that you can't restore the economy without containing the virus. I mean, there's only one way to do that, and that is to accept the health con consequences of the virus, open the economy up and suffer the consequences in terms of, you know, sickness, death, and so on. And most, most countries are not willing to do that. Uh, in fact, I can't think of any exceptions. So, so that, that produces this hard link. Um, but, you know, after that, I mean, the ba basically, I think what you want to do um, at, you know, any government will want to focus on this and, and encourage the private sector and the educational sectors to be a partner in this is to focus on the people who have been hardest hit uh, economically by the pandemic. And that's what these stimulus programs have, have, have been focused on. They're trying to keep people uh, they're trying to keep businesses in business by giving them a little more runway before. Um, and the, the, and the, I'm, I'm going to go in circles here. The reason this vaccine rollout is so important is you can't keep people, you know, uh, you can't support them forever. So if you have four years, you know, or three, you know, where you've got to keep people. So you're just going to lose a lot more businesses. You're going to have a whole lot more household balance sheet damage than is necessary. And so I, you know, I think I think for the for all all countries and for whatever we have in terms of capacity for global co coordination, um, item one on the list has to be the vaccine rollout. I mean, I think the the other things we talked about, you know, in this report that Mark referred to, which is the SDR is expanding fiscal capacity. And, and getting ready to do some kind of sensible debt restructuring. They're important, um, but, but not at the same level as the vaccine rollout. Mike, if I, if I can um, follow up on what you just said, you know, one of the, uh, we look at the, the year 2000 where we have a lot of crises, you know, around the world in, in our in macro, that was mainly dealing with financial crisis. And we came up, after that, with some policy responses, there was a creation of G20 to look carefully of crisis prevention and crisis resolution, so to look and detect vulnerability in the financial system. We know that with this pandemic, you know, the banking sector was maybe more of a solution uh, to, 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 the, to the policy response. Do you think that if we are going to go to a world where we might be going back to uh, more, more pandemic, that the world will be facing more pandemic, you know, in the medium future, that we need to think about a system of crisis prevention and crisis resolution in, in, in health, like uh, bringing all the health authorities around the, within the G20. So like thinking about that, maybe, yeah, we deal with a lot of crisis that was with the financial sector. Now it's going to be more driven by health. So to start to think about institution building here at the global level, because this is going to be something that uh, we remember we have SARS, we have already a couple of health issues, you know, in the, 
in the previous year. So that's maybe the international community. We need to think about creating something similar than what we did with the financial sector. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, you know, I hope that's yeah. the outcome. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> history is not encouraging in this dimension. I remember um, it, after the Ebola, uh, the latest round of the Ebola pandemic about five years ago, uh, Bill Gates said, you know, we got to get rid. This isn't the last time something like this is going to happen. We have to get ready. Um, and actually, and a few governments, including the American government, had experts, you know, prepare plans for dealing with a pandemic. Unfortunately, it sort of stopped there and nobody at higher levels did anything, did anything about it. You know, one of the reasons some of the Asian economies were, you know, were more successful in containing the virus is they've been practicing, you know, with, you know, SARS and H1N1 and et cetera, you know, I mean, so bottom line is, I'm a little cynical about this, you know, I'm, I'll tell you my worry. My worry is we're gonna get through this pandemic and then breathe and be so fed up with the whole thing, we breathe a sigh of relief and then do nothing to get ourselves ready for the next one. I mean, that's the cynical view. Um, and the hopeful view is we learned a lesson that we're, we have resilience issues in multiple dimensions. One of them is climate change, one, several of them are in health. And that we, a, a, an important area for international cooperation is to kind of think through um, what we're gonna, how we're gonna invest in greater resilience. Yes, absolutely. In an inclusive way, in an inclusive way. Maxet, uh, one yes. more and final questions, maybe you want. Yes, uh, if I may, uh, we were talking about uh, technologies and uh, the new companies, but uh, for the moment, everyone in technology sector afraid uh, the inflation. Uh, do you think inflation uh, will be again in US and? Uh, do you think that uh, it will hardly affect the technology sector and uh, the rising bond yields will affect on it? Or you think that it is a temporary issue? Um, it's an important question. First, let me say my perspective on this is we don't know, right? Yeah. I mean, what we do know is that we've lived in a world in which we had record low levels of uh, uh, unemployment and no uh, sign of inflation. So what most people have concluded, including me, but people are more expert than I am, is that there's some structural change. The Phillips curve used to have a slope to it. The Phillips curve is now flat. Now that's not necessarily a permanent condition, but it does suggest that, you know, the standard anchors we used in thinking about inflation, employment, you know, and so on are, uh, have been kind of moved, somebody moved the boys. Uh, so my view is you can't reject the notion that we might get inflation with sort of massive programs like this. M my best guess is it's unlikely that we'll get significant sustained inflation. We don't really have those um, circular ways of sustaining inflation that we used to have 25 years ago. You know, we don't have indexed, you know, wages much anymore, um, et cetera. So bottom line is, you know, uh, the financial markets will get worried about it and long-term bond yields will sort of go up um, a little bit. Uh, and then you'll see it in the stock markets, but in the, in the real economy, I, you know, and so if you listen to Bloomberg, you know, they'll spend hours and hours talking about these things because it affects asset prices. And, uh, but I, but in the real economy, I don't, I don't think it's, it's sort of the main event. I mean, it, you know, there's all this talk about, you know, sort of, uh, you know, output gaps, which depend on the concept of potential output, which is very hard to measure, uh, and so on. So, um, my view is probably in many economies, there's more capacity than we know how to measure to expand output. Um, when we need to. Uh, that said, you know, I mean, I, you know, commodities could drive a little bit of inflation. Uh, we could raise the minimum wage in the United States and that might produce a little bit of inflation, but, but I don't think of it as a kind of runway with a kind of takeoff as, uh, as 
at least personal opinion, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. On that note, Maxat, uh, thank you again for being those. Professor Max Prince, thank you very much. I think one of my takeaway is clear. Let's do the whatever it takes for vaccination all over the world, because this is a way to, that we can remove uncertainties and we can get you know, uh, a sustainable recovery for the global economy. I think that's, I totally agree with you. you know, that the, at least we have a solution. We need just to, to deploy it. You do know? it, so right. You know, let's do it. That's you right. <laughs> great, well, it was exactly a great right. thing, you know? Great pleasure for being with us, Fernander, and looking forward hopefully to my meet pleasure. you know somewhere in the world soon. You know, great. Thank yeah, you, for my thank you, so. organizers, and looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Thanks, Spence. Uh, it was an honor to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max. That I was a huge pleasure to be here. I, uh, yeah. Good. Thanks. Bye. Bye.